Hello and welcome to the first launch, to the launch of the first Uranium Atlas. I'm Klaus Bieger, the journalist by trade, but also an anti-nuke activist. Ever since Venona Latyuk in 1977 at the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, told me I should focus on uranium. After the Chernobyl accident in 1986, I initiated the World Uranium Hearing, which took place in Salzburg, Austria. And two of our guests tonight are witnesses from Salzburg in 1992. One of the many results of the World Uranium Hearing is the International Nuclear Free Future Award, which honors individuals and initiatives around the globe who fight for a nuclear free future. And it is this circle where the idea for the Atlas was born. We were an editorial quartet, so to speak, Horst Hamm, Linda Pence Gunther, myself and our graphic artist, Tanja Hoffmann. And of course, this is important to mention, our work would have been impossible without the excellent scientific experts and indigenous activists around the world. Uranium is the raw material for the atomic age. Our atlas shows all facets, from mining to the dead end of the nuclear chain. With me as co-host is Linda Pence Gunther, one of our atlas team. I am in Munich, Germany. Linda is in Tacoma Park near Washington, DC. And our technical director, Franz Drexel, is in Berlin. This is our first collaboration. We'll see how it works. Linda, it's your turn. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Linda Pence Gunter with Beyond Nuclear. We are a nonprofit nuclear, anti nuclear and environmental organization based, as Klaus mentioned, in Tacoma Park, Maryland, which is actually a nuclear free city. We're very proud of that. Uh, welcome everybody. We have a wonderful array of speakers today. Beyond Nuclear was honored to be part of this wonderful publication, which you all now have access to, the Uranium Atlas. We are live streaming today on YouTube and Facebook, and throughout this broadcast, you can put in your questions. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation for all our panelists, but if something springs to mind during the broadcast, you can type it anytime, and these questions will be relayed to us. Uh, as time permits, we will get to as many of them as possible. Today, of course, is a very important anniversary, a solemn day in many ways, July 16th, there are two anniversaries that we're noting today, and Klaus is going to tell you about the first one. Klaus? Well, we chose today to present the Atlas because today, 75 years ago, the atomic age began with the explosion of the first atomic bomb called Trinity. July 16th, 1945 was a Monday. It was the Monday which changed the world. And we have another anniversary, Linda. Yes, indeed. You tell it. The other anniversary, also July 16th, 1979, happened again in New Mexico at Church Rock when the uranium mill tailings dam there breached. And that resulted in the biggest release, accidental but avoidable, the biggest release of radioactive waste in American history at Church Rock. Klaus? Yeah, but first we remain with Trinity. Trinity was the result of the Manhattan Project, the secret project in the secret city of Los Alamos, where the first bomb was built. And the team around scientists, physicists, Robert Oppenheimer and General Leslie Groves was not sure if they would uh, ignite the atmosphere. They were not sure, but they decided for it against their moral scruples. They went into the desert of white sands in southern New Mexico. It was indigenous land, the land of the Mescalero Apache, but most of them were not even aware of it. And we have somebody here who 
is active right now, but we had to record her statement because he's, she's very busy on July 16th. Linda will explain you why. And that is Tina Cordova. She is a sixth generation New Mexican and founder of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. Tina was of, not surprisingly busy today but she knows very well firsthand what it's like to live in the shadow of an atomic test. She herself is a survivor of thyroid cancer and many members of her family and the wider community have suffered cancers as well. Tina co-founded the consortium in 2005 to draw attention to and seek compensation for the unwilling victims of the very first atomic test ever conducted at Trinity. Let's now hear from Tina. July 16th, 1945 at 520, nine and 45 seconds AM, the US government detonated the first atomic bomb that was detonate any place in the world. And it happened to be in the desert of South Central New Mexico in an area that they referred to then and continue to refer, refer to now as an area that was remote and uninhabited. But we know from census data that's available from the 1940s that there were tens of thousands of people living in a 50 mile radius to the site and if you expand the radius to 150 miles, and I'll explain that in a moment, the numbers actually are in the hundreds of thousands. And so they detonated this device. They, they had little concern for safety. They had more concern for secrecy. They had to make certain that the device detonated that morning. And there's, there are some things about that bomb that make it very unique unto itself. For example, not only unique unto itself, but very heavily fallout producing, which has deadly consequences for people. So for example, the bomb was detonated on a tower 100 feet off the ground. The blast force of the bomb had no place to go. So it literally came down, intercepted the earth, took up an enormous amount of dirt, sand, animal and plant life, incinerated it because it actually created more heat and more light than the sun. Took a fireball over seven miles past the atmosphere into the stratosphere. And of course, whatever goes up has to come down. And what came down for days afterwards was a radioactive ash that dispersed itself all over the desert of New Mexico. Now there, the reason that, uh, I bring that to everyone's attention is because no bomb was ever detonated on a platform 100 feet off the ground ever again. They absolutely knew that that was the worst case scenario for the production of fallout. So in regards to that, they actually detonated the bombs in Japan at 1600 and 1800 feet respectively, because what they wanted to do in Japan was not create fallout, but to create destruction. The other thing about the bomb that was very unique is that it was incredibly inefficient. It was overpacked with plutonium. They absolutely did that so that the bomb would detonate and there would be no, it would not be a failure. And so they put 13 pounds of weapons grade plutonium in that bomb, but only three pounds actually fissioned. The remaining 10 pounds became part of that radioactive cloud that went over seven miles past the atmosphere into the stratosphere. Now, plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years, and it's the most to toxic substance known to man. And so as the ash fell from the sky, it contained plutonium particles. And you only have to ingest or inhale one particle of plutonium, and it remains in your body, giving off radiation for the remainder of time. Once the plutonium became part of the fireball that exceeded the, the atmosphere and came down as fallout, it became part of the water table 
and the soil and the entire environment. So we've been working. I've been at this for 15 years, trying to bring attention to the negative health effects the people in New Mexico have suffered as a result of the Trinity test. And we've had bills introduced into the US Congress for 10 years now to actually add us to what's called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, uh, a bill that was passed in 1990 to compensate and take care of downwinders from the Nevada test site. And why the people of New Mexico were left out is beyond imagination because not only were we the first people exposed to radiation any place, we were exposed to far more radiation than anybody ever was as a result of the Nevada test site because exposure to radiation is a factor of distance and time. And we've actually identified people that lived as close as 12 miles to the Trinity test site. And there were, there were villages 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away. And none of those people have ever been acknowledged or taken care of by the US government. Extraordinary testimony there from Tina Cordova. I actually saw her, I was with her when she testified in Congress a few years ago, making that case for compensation for the downwinders in New Mexico. It was news to me that they'd been left out and an extraordinary omission, which hopefully will be rectified. Of course, today is another anniversary, as we mentioned. Uh, eerily, on, in 1979, on July 16th, it was at the same time as that Trinity test, 5.30 in the morning, that the church rock accident happened. And it was just a few months after the much better known Three Mile Island accident in March of that same year. And yet church rock remains a far more hidden story. But one person was there to witness the effect of that disaster. And Klaus is now going to tell you about him. Klaus? Yeah, well, one of the first people to arrive at the location in the morning of July 16th 1979 was Larry King, a Navajo man who worked at the mine. And here is his story recorded last week. And I want to say thank you to Susan Gordon from MACE, the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment, for providing this testimony for us. Hello, my name is Larry King. I'm 62 years old and I've been uh, involved with this uh, grassroots organization about uranium issues, addressing uranium issues and uranium uh, a a legacy because I live in the midst of uh, uranium, uh, an abandoned uranium mines, uh, the tailing spills of July 16, 1979. When I was working as the underground server, there was one day I was called out. I, my supervisor told me to stay on surface, don't go on the ground. We need to go over to the mill site. There was a lot of commotion there, a lot of people. You could see a lot of uh, people uh, from the higher ups. So I started w- w- uh, looking around too on the on the, the dike there. And I noticed huge cracks. And they were big enough to put my hand in there. They were about the cracks were about that wide. And when you look down, it was pitch black. So I knew that those cracks were were way down. We just got back into the vehicle. He said, let's go back. And we went back to the office at the mine site. And that was that. Kind of heard from my from my department that there was the, the dam had broken. I said, oh, wow, where? And so after I got off shift and I was driving by and I looked in that direction, and it was in the same area when I, where I saw those huge cracks. And there was a huge gaping hole. Over 94 million gallons of radioactive and toxic water that was released. And I've seen, um, I, I, I kind of remember an image in my, in my head after the next day when I drove by there, where it, um, it, it, in the wash uh, where, where the highway that goes up to the mine site, there's there's a portion right by my house where it crosses and I look into the uh, riverbed and 
huge sludge, and it was a catastrophe through that wash. The uh, riverbed, innocent people that had nothing to do with the mine, how, how many people got exposed to all this toxic waste that was left behind? Ninety million gallons of radioactive waste was spilled that day. And of course, the contamination, as Larry so movingly described, continues to this day, affecting the Navajo Nation, who suffered the consequences. Well, now it's time to begin the Atlas portion of our program. And we are delighted to welcome our wonderful lineup of live guests who are joining us today beginning with Anna Rondon of the Navajo Nation. She is the program director of the New Mexico Social Justice and Equity Institute. We also have with us Ian Zabate. He is principal man of the Western bands of the Shoshone Nation of Indians. We have Makoma Lekalakla, who is the director of Earth Life Africa, Johannesburg office. And we have Sasha Hach, formerly with ICANN and now with the Nuclear Free Future Foundation. So welcome to all our live guests and Klaus will now begin the program uh, where we address some of the specific components in the Atlas. Klaus? Well, again, this is the cover and we have Yvonne Margarula here looking at some reactors, but below we have the bomb going up. And when we look at the story of uranium, it was first used for bombs. And uh, that's where we'd like to stay for a while. And uh, in our atlas, we have a graphic which shows the threat by nuclear bombs of today. And I'm going to talk about that um, in a moment. We'll show you that specific page. But what I wanted to say first is that atomic tests devastated lives across the world, especially indigenous communities. In the US, it affected Native American populations and Hispanic populations, most particularly in New Mexico and in uh, Nevada but also populations, other populations further away. For example, in St. George, Utah, very famously, a hundred miles from the Nevada test site and a place where John Wayne filmed The Conqueror and most famously over half of that cast and crew died prematurely uh, from cancers. So now we've got Trump talking about atomic tests, resuming atomic tests, and we should look at this map and see the incredible impact that atomic testing has already had on the world. As you can see, the US conducted a total of 1,054 atomic tests during the Cold War, 216 of them atmospheric, comprising more than half of all the atomic tests ever conducted by the nuclear powers. And as you can see, most of the US bombs, 912 of them, were mm -hmm. detonated at what was then called the Nevada test site. But there's another little number there in green, which Ian Zavate took care to point out to me, and that's the British atomic tests that were also conducted in Nevada. So that number is quite a bit higher. Um, Ian is now going to be introduced by Klaus, but before he does that, I just want to remind everybody that uh, we are live streaming this on Facebook and on YouTube. And if you have questions that you'd like to ask our speakers, please type them into the chat anytime and we will be addressing some of those at the end of the presentation to our speakers. But now over to you Klaus to introduce Ian Zabate. Yeah, as you already said, uh, Linda, Ian Zabate is the principal man for the Western Shoshone and a long time front activist like the late spiritual leader Corbin Harney and the Dan sisters. Western Shoshone have been in our world for a long time. I mean, the world of activism. Ian is a movement organizer and a man who I never saw tired. In 1992, at the World Uranium Hearing, as a young man, 
he represented the Western Shoshone in Nevada, and he said, we are the most bombed nation of the world. These words are branded in my memory. Ian, can you tell us how did you become the most bombed nation in the world, and what are you and your people doing to heal the land and the people? I have been involved with defending the land and people, the Western Shoshone people, uh, since I came home to the reservation in central Nevada in 1986 and found that my family was dying. The fallout from the weapons testing uh, made us downwinders. There are near downwinders, such as uh, my people and the people in Utah, which are about 100 miles from the test site. And then there are far downwinders, which are people that as far as 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles, and globally, all weapons testing, even the underground weapons tests vent. They vent that radiation into the sky. A good example is the 1986 Mighty Oak accident and cover up. This radiation went around the world and it happened about three weeks before the Chernobyl accident. And that radiation was discovered before the Chernobyl radiation. And we would not have known if Chernobyl hadn't itself uh, 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 had an accident. Uh, we were waiting and looking for Chernobyl radiation and the researchers waiting for that radiation found the Mighty Oak radiation. These activities are conducted in secret. I became involved when I found that my family was dying and uh, uh, it was the fallout from the radiation. The more I investigated, the more I understood that the fallout killed my family uh, with strange types of cancer, uh, childhood leukemia, and that we were not being told the truth. Later on, uh, the United States Congress, there's been a deliberate act to destroy the Shoshone people. The United States Congress defined our Indian horses, our Indian ponies as wild horses. There's no such thing as a wild horses. These are horses that were brought to America and we raise these horses, we use these as our livestock in the United States Congress, stole our horses by labeling them as wild so that their government Bureau of Land Management could enforce their regulations against us. They stole our livelihood, they stole our horses, blaming us for the destruction of the range with our livestock when it was the nuclear weapons test that did that. So that's how I became involved and I've been fighting the United States uh, corruption, the United States destroying our delicate flora and fauna for about 35 years. And they kill my family and they're not gonna get away with it. That's what's happening. That's what we're trying to do to address this. In every other part of the world, there are uh, health registries, there are uh, uh, DNA testing, such as in New Zealand for uh, soldiers that were involved in uh, the research in the Pacific, but not here in the United States. Other places in uh, Kazakhstan, there are health registries, there's surveillance, there's monitoring, but not here in the United States. I was involved in, 19, uh, in the 1990 Radiation Exposure Compensation Act with uh, uh, Stuart Udall from Utah, who is a uh, Secretary, former Secretary of the Interior, uh, but we could only get 15 primary cancers. We've been fighting the culture of secrecy that won't release data, that won't do the studies that are necessary to protect the Western bands of the Shoshone Nation of Indians. So I must do that. That's my responsibility. That's my commitment to my land and my people. So the United States has detonated uh, as the Atlas shows, 912, 24 jointly with the United Kingdom. Uh, the United, United Kingdom has some responsibility here to also uh, uh, mitigate the impacts from its testing. We look at the fallout, we look at the uh, situation with Trinity and currently before the United States Congress, there is the 2019 Radiation Exposure Compensation Act that we're looking to get funded. It is currently in committees and we need to get those bills out and get them funded. That's what we need. We don't need additional nuclear weapons testing. 
We haven't even addressed the impacts from the uh, 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 912 tests that have already been conducted. We need to get back and focus on making sure that people's health is a priority. I believe that the fallout that is spread across the continent and across the world is the reason why all people need universal health care. We need to have these things investigated. We need to have these things understood. Lifestyle is important. And based on our indigenous lifestyle, diet, mobility, and shelter, what we ate, where we went, and where our houses were, we received significantly higher dose than the non-Native American population. We need compensation, we need impact mitigation, and we need that help yesterday. So we hope that other people will work with us and support our efforts to uh, have that basic human dignity and support now. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, Ian. And in fact, this week coming up, we will have uh, some of what Ian just told you uh, in a beautiful article that he has written that will be appearing on the Beyond Nuclear International website. So you can look for that there. Uh, the atomic tests that Ian described are largely over those kinds of atomic tests, although we, of course we don't know exactly what North Korea might or might not be doing. But the US for one is still conducting subcritical tests. And the point of this is to accelerate the production really of new nuclear weapons. Although the world nuclear powers have significantly reduced their nuclear arsenals down to a mere 14,000, um, the US and Russia are talking about refurbishment and upgrades, which is really code for new nuclear weapons. So the question is, are we heading into a new Cold War style arms race? Or are we, as the ratifications mount up for the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, heading instead towards a new paradigm of peace? Well, we have the perfect guest to answer those two questions, and Klaus is now going to introduce him. It's a great pleasure to introduce Sasha. He was a board member of ICANN Germany when ICANN received the Peace Nobel Prize in 2017. He's a peace researcher and since last fall, part of the Nuclear Free Future Award team. And I'm very happy because for 20 years I was uh, the director of the Nuclear Free Future Award and I was looking for the next generation and I asked him and he said yes. So that's why I'm so happy to introduce him. I can got the Nobel Prize for a historic treaty the treaty to abolish all nuclear weapons. And this treaty is waiting to be signed at the United Nations in New York. 81 states have signed so far. So it is still a long way to go. Sasha, tell us about the nuclear arsenal of today and why this treaty is facing so much opposition. So, <clears throat> thank you, Klaus. So um, today we have um, nine nuclear weapon states. Um, there are um, the five. I don't see you. Here you are. You're back. Okay. I hope that it works. But you are still no voice from you. It looks like Sasha is still on mute. Okay. Yeah. And no. once he is on off mute, Klaus, you need to go on mute, I think. So now you should hear me, right? Yes. Okay. So Klaus asked about the state of uh, the nuclear arms race or the nuclear arsenals worldwide. Um, and today we have nine nuclear weapon states. So these are the five um, permanent members of the UN, sorry, um, of the UN Security Council, uh, the United States, Russia, um, the UK, France, and China. Plus we have four more nuclear weapon states with um, India, Pakistan, Israel, and uh, North Korea. So all those states possess about 13,400 nuclear weapons. And um, 
1,800 of those uh, nuclear weapons are kept in a high operational alert. Um, in the um, in the uranium atlas, you can uh, see that um, just two states possess 93% um, um, of the worldwide um, nuclear weapons arsenals. These states are Russia and uh, the United States. And almost all of the nuclear weapon states, especially those ones in China, which is also in the middle of a modernization and expansion of its arsenal, and uh, India and Pakistan are thought to be increasing the size of their arsenals um, as well. North Korea, as um, we know, puts the nuclear, its nuclear capabilities, its nuclear program also in the center of its national security strategy. So now we are only, I've only talked about the military capabilities, the nuclear weapons systems, how th those capabilities are um, moder modernized and updated. And at the same time, we see when we look now at the doctrines and the policies, that the roles of nuclear weapons in military plans and doctrines is expanding. The United States and Russia are developing or deploying new weapon system, focusing on so-called low yield uh, nuclear warheads with a relatively smaller explosive force, but still superior to um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. And at the same time, while focusing on such relatively smaller warheads, uh, they do not exclude a first strike policy as uh, they uh, did uh, before, at least the United States. So this means that the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons, looking at the capabilities and the doctrines, is uh, um, decreasing, has uh, declined tremendously. All this is happening in a context where arms control uh, agreements are suspended. Uh, the United States and Russia have canceled the INF Treaty. Uh, the United States uh, announced that it would quit the Open Skies Treaty and the New START Treaty. It's a treaty on the reduction of um, strategic nuclear weapons will lapse in February 2021, unless both parties agree to prolong it, which is still an open question. So while the military capabilities are getting more operational, the doctrines are, are getting more loose. Um, at the same time, looking at the arms control regime, we see that we lose also key channels of communication transparency that have helped in the past to prevent misperceptions and a new um, nuclear arms race or even confrontation. So this is a bit the groomy picture. And as you have pointed out, um, there is a new development among the non-nuclear weapon states, um, uh, which uh, had a big success on July 7th, 2017, when an overwhelming majority of states adopted a global agreement to ban nuclear weapons. So this agreement is uh, called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It will enter into force once 50 nations have signed and ratified it. So far, 39 states have already ratified it, so there's still a little path to go, but it's, uh, continuing, it's continuously progressing. So why this um, uh, opposition of the nuclear weapon states against this uh, treaty? Until now, nuclear weapons were the only weapons of mass destruction that were not subject to comprehensive ban, unlike uh, biological weapons or chemical um, weapons. And this despite the catastrophic humanitarian and environmental consequences. So this new treaty fills a legal gap in international law, uh, which was very um, opportune for the nuclear weapon states before, because it prohibits now to possess, to develop, to test, to produce, to use nuclear weapons, but also to threaten to use nuclear weapons. And it prohibits also states to allow nuclear weapon states to station nuclear weapons on their territory. Um, and this movement is pretty big um, in the negotiations in the United Nations 2017, there were 135 uh, states participating. So for the first time, there was a majority of states which united against and not only criticized, but also acted against the status quo of the nuclear world order that, they, that I just described. And so for the first time, we see this kind of legal resistance 
by the non-nuclear weapon states. Thank you, Sasha. I think we're going back to Klaus now to talk about the impact of uranium mining. So Klaus, are you on to talk about the pathway of uranium mining? We have a graphic to show you called the duration of infinity. And I think Klaus is next up to show you that. Well, we seem to be having difficulty hearing you, Klaus, and so we're not seeing you at the moment. So we'll give him a minute or two, just there okay. he is. Okay, so now we're ready to go to you, Klaus, to uh, tell us a little bit about the fundamental problems of uranium mining, and specifically a very interesting graphic in the Atlas called the duration of infinity. Klaus. This is the graphic, but we had it prepared Obviously, we have technical difficulties. Well, the story is that when uranium is taken from the ground, often we hear, well, it was the radioactive substance is taken away, so it's good for the people there. I heard this remark several times, at different locations. But the problem is that only uranium-235 is taken, and uh, the rest all the decay elements remain. And those decay elements, they shift. I mean, it's a very magical thing. But all of a sudden, we have radon, radium, polonium, thorium, uranium, uh, which stay in the tailings and threaten the people. And uh, we have a graphic in the atlas, which is uh, which was produced for a talk for the Dene people by Beyond Nuclear, and it shows the attacks on the organs. Linda. And that, um, that graphic was deliberately chosen because it features a pregnant woman, and um, it shows, uh, it's very difficult, I'm sorry that you can't see the graphic, uh, anymore, and I'm not seeing me, so I'm not sure if I can, let me see, yes. So there we go, this is the graphic. I'll hold it as close to the screen as I can so that you get a look at it. it if you are already looking at the Atlas, it's on page 11. Uh, we have made the Atlas available on our website. So if you want to follow along with the actual Atlas, you can do so. And uh, the Radiation Monitoring Project developed this particular diagram of a pregnant woman because it is in fact she, and the fetus she's carrying, and that the baby that she will then bear, who are the most susceptible to harm from exposure to radiation and the least protected. And so it was originally designed to help Native American women understand for the Radiation Monitoring Project what happens in the body when you are exposed to these particular radioactive elements. No one knows really why women in particular are more susceptible than men, but we do know why her fetus and her baby and children are more susceptible. And that is of course, because their cells are still rapidly dividing. But none of these are protected adequately because the so-called radiation standards that we have, which establish what an allowable dose is, and I'm doing the inverted commas sign because allowable does not mean safe, which establishes what the allowable exposure dose is, is based on a 20-something healthy white male. And of course, the dose that he could perhaps absorb with less damage is not the same as the harm that will be done to pregnant women and children. And so we have to always remember that when you hear allowable, it does not mean safe. We have a wonderful guest who can explain this a little bit more, and Klaus is now going to introduce Anna. Yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce Anna Rondon from the Diné. That's what the Navajo call themselves. For the past 35 years, Anna Rondon has worked in various leadership positions, and today she serves as the project director of the New Mexico Social Justice and Equity Institute and the McKinley Coll Collaborative for Health Equity. There she's the coordinator. 
Anna follows the uranium trail for a long time. As an employee of the Navajo Nation government, she was involved in the Navajo Birth Cohort Study, which was conducted in partnership with the University of New Mexico, the Southwest Research and Information Center, and other institutions. If you want to give a face to resistance against uranium mining, it sure is the face of Anna Rondon. Anna, you were a witness at the World Uranium Hearing. Now, 28 years later, you, as a grandmother, you are still fighting the same fight. Please tell us how your people are still impacted by the mining today, even if the mines are not in use anymore. Great. I'm Ani, Towering House people, and born for Nakai Dene and my grandfathers are born Edgewater. Uh, I'm really happy to see everyone here and, and how the Atlas is being presented today, July 16th, one of the worst days in humanity as we know it. Um, in terms of the impacts of uranium mining still continuing to uh, impact our people, um, our environment, and especially our water. Water, as you know, each of us, most of the living things in creation is all born from water. So it's the first point of connection we have in this universe. And uranium in itself is born for fire. Fire has not been taken care of in terms of exposing the uranium to our people and that we already knew that it was already dangerous. Thomas Benyaka shared with us many times the story of how coal and uranium are in the earth to attract the thunder and the lightning. We are on the rooftop of the world, the, the Colorado Plateau is, is the, one of the main homes equivalent to the sister mountain of the Himalayas, which is the other rooftop of the world. It's our home. Both rooftops of the world housed many peoples, red, yellow, black, and white. And we all were told that we had a responsibility to take care of the air, the water, the earth, and the fire. The fire was given to the white people to take care of. The water was taken care of by our African-American brothers and sisters. The air is taken care of by our Asian brothers and sisters. The earth is taken care of by our indigenous peoples of the earth. When we violate it, by force to expose our people to these dangerous elements that hold de that whole uh, deconstructions of our genetic makeup of who we are as a people as as creation that has been disrupted many means and now our people are Finally, getting health studies. We are still trying to keep uranium away from our territories. As of today, the companies still want to mine and they are still eyeing uh, United States uranium resources. The United States EPA became um, uh, a party to the 523 abandoned uranium mines. And they had the lead in doing negotiations with the Navajo Nation. There was a settlement with the Tronics Corporation and there was $1.7 billion appropriated for the cleanup of the abandoned uranium mines. There's really only been one uranium mine cleaned up so called, but you know, it's just a temporary containment. As you know, the monster, the nuclear beast 
continues even after the so-called cleanup. We, this app continue as learning platform for the next seven generations beyond. It's the technology, the imagination of how we can do or how we can protect ourselves. How can we clean our water lies in the hands of our young people the engineers, the architects, doctors. So mentioned that in 1986, the Nation Chairman Peterson in a uranium moratorium through the arena containment of the Cameron uranium mine. Then in 1992, in in sync with the World Uranium Hearing, we got Peter's author a statement in solidarity with the World Uranium Hearing. Many activists within our four sacred mountains and beyond, Norman Brown, Phil Harrison, uh, different indigenous women that stood up, gathered, mobilized, to pass the 2005 Diné Resources Protection Act that prohibits and bans uranium mining. That is one of the first laws, policy that helps protect our homelands. However, you know that we are on a reservation, just as military reservations. We were up against, in 1978, termination of our treaties, termination of our water rights. That was to terminate who we were as a people. That can still happen. And we always have to be on guard, alert. And that's why it's so important that these types of documents help us build any type of court that we take this to. There still needs to be more reparations to our peoples around this world. All the indigenous peoples throughout these continents have sacred sites. Uranium are near these sacred sites for a purpose. As Thomas Binyaka mentioned, it's the great spiritual natural law of how everything was in balance to live in harmony, that our prayers would be answered through our mineral offerings, through our sacred corn pollen, which looks so much like the uranium dust. We are going to find a balance again because of truth. truth to the hope of the future of humanity. It's through these sacred connections. We're all met for a purpose as warriors, as monster slayers. And we continue with every weapon, every tool. So when you take a drink of water, remember the indigenous peoples in India, Africa, Tibet, South America, and here on my homeland, where our people, 401 of our people, Navajo people have died of COVID. Many of them cannot wash their hands because one in three families haul water. Our water sources are contaminated. That is why our people are passing away. Also because of the isolation, not being able to hear what's going on in the world through not having internet, reliable phone service. So the, the ones that are the most impacted here on Navajo are the ones that are without. And with the uranium beast having its grip still on our people and our land and our water. 
we still must continue to fight and be vigilant and and more importantly ceremonially to remember that we're here for a purpose each of you were given a, a holy spirit to guide you and today i'm happy that it guided me to all of you thank you Wonderful, Anna, thank you so much. Such, such eloquent words. Uh, we had some technical difficulties seeing you clearly all the time, but your words were so powerful, we didn't even really need to. Um, I'm gonna go over to Klaus now, who's gonna talk a little bit about the neocolonialism that has really been the story of the nuclear age, Klaus. Would you have to unmute yourself first, Klaus? There we go. Yes, I would say at this moment in time that we cannot cover all the issues which we have in the Atlas. For example, depleted uranium is a major issue, but it will not be part of our program. And due to the time difficulties, we have not everybody from, we don't have representatives from all continents here. And we also have nobody from Canada here. We are very sorry, but uh, this is how it is. But we are aware that Canada uh, is suffering, the indigenous people of Canada are suffering from uranium mining a lot. And uh, uh, we send greetings to the Cree of Quebec who managed to uh, stop uranium mining in their territory a few years ago. So, the neocolonialism is also a racism. All over the world, when you look at a map of uranium mining, then you could also have, you could also put a map of indigenous peoples on top of it. And then you see more than 75% of uranium mines are on indigenous people's land. So today we have discussions about racism. We should, uh, tell people who are for nuclear power and who don't want to be a racist, you know, if you are for nuclear power, then you have to be for uranium mining and uranium mining is a threat to the earth and all living beings. There is no safe uranium mining. Linda. And there certainly isn't in South Africa either. And our next guest uh, can tell you a little bit about the rather interesting connection between uranium mining and gold mining. I'm honored to introduce Makoma Lekalakala. She is the director of Earth Life Africa in Johannesburg. And in 2018, Makoma shared the Goldman Environmental Prize for Africa with Liz McDade for stopping the plans of Russia's Rosatom who wanted to build new nuclear power plants in South Africa. I, I jokingly refer to this as Putin Putin and was a great success. Um, but unfortunately, the new government of South Africa is taking another look at nuclear power. So the battle is by no means won. But when you think of South Africa, a sunny place, a natural for renewable energy, it's quite logical, as Makoma asks, why go nuclear? Over to you, Makoma. Welcome. Thank you. And um, thank you to everyone. Uh, also for the invitation. I'm speaking to you from Johannesburg, the most radioactive city in the world brought by the legacy of gold mining. Most of the abundant gold mines are, are around the largest city in South Africa. It's piled next to residential communities, most of which are black. During the months of August and September, one of the residents in this area had said that the dust is terrible. You stop dusting as it's useless, but you risk inhaling the dust, which is highly radioactive. Johannesburg townships are paying for its gold mining past. According to Dr. Anthony Tatton, who's the professor at the University of Free State, 
uh, for the on the environmental management and he says Johannesburg is undoubtedly the most radioactive city in the world. He further on says that in the late 1800s, gold mining era uranium was merely a waste product and therefore dumped without being recovered. The tailing disposal facilities therefore have a relatively high uranium concentrate, concentration today since mines abandoned and not decommissioned, decommissions does uranium leaches from tailings and enters as, as runoff into surrounding streams and wetlands around the former gold mining areas. But then in 2017, a partner organization, Benchmark Foundations, an NGO based in Johannesburg that works with communities in these impacted areas, conducted a study that found out that 56% of the area's residents suffer from respiratory diseases because they live near the largest concentration of radioactive uranium on the planet. For, for quite many decades, um, South Africa was the main uranium supplier on the Africa, uh, from the African continent. But today we, found, we find that um, Namibia which is a neighboring country and Niger have taken that place. And we also realized that around 2008 and 2009, the price of uranium skyrocketed to even sevenfold. And uranium companies all over the world flocked into Africa to leave no stone, no stone unturned to find uranium. But then today we witness the misery the devastation, the slow and unnoticed genocide in South Africa around Johannesburg areas of Rivali, Snake Park, and, and, and Deep Roof. We also witness in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in the province of Hart Katanga. We also witness in Niger around the Alid region and in Tanzania near the Mkuju River and in Namibia in the Namib Desert. So there's a slow, unnoticed genocide taking place due to uranium mining in the African continent. But then this is a new form of colonialism. And um, what we see now with the price of uranium skyrocketing, um, that uh, African governments are forced to prioritize unsustainable development contrary to even the sustainable development goals that they have committed themselves to. With Africa's unexploited, clean, affordable, and the possibility of decentralized energy system, we see an amb ambition to nuclearize Africa. Over more than 10 countries in Africa are being bullied into nuclear energy, which is dangerous, expensive, and unwanted by multinational corporations that most of them are in Europe. Uranium has become a blessing to those who do not have regard for life driven by greed. It is a curse for indigenous and poor people around the world whom their lives are made to be unbearable. On numerous occasions, those who live near uranium mines have voiced concerns over the impacts on public health. People have reported high incidences of lung cancers, high incidences of leukemia, high inst instances of stomach, cancer, of stomach cancers and birth decay. And also people have been struggling to breathe because of the unbearable dust, particularly those who live around the mine tailings. Uranium also has a, a very negative impact on the wider natural environment. In the case of natural environment, these concerns include the risk of environmental degradation, contamination of the soil, reduced ecosystems viability and biodiversity, contamination of public amenities, contamination of land, and quarantining of land for future beneficial use. 
for the sake of people's health, our ecosystem, and general life on earth, the madness of uranium mining has got to stop. And today we are presented with opportunities, though this pandemic is devastating, but it also gives us an opportunity to rethink our energy system, to rethink our governance system, to rethink what is that, how, what is that that we can do in order, in order for us to protect our biodiversity. And as we speak currently, those who are living around the areas where uranium is being mined or where there has been tailings, because they, they, they actually suffer more than other people. If you check, these are the people who are most vulnerable and those are the people who are likely to die due to the environment that is unbearable around them. Thank you very much. Well, so I think we're going to hear from Klaus, who will introduce a fascinating video from Australia. Klaus? Yeah, we go to Australia. And as I mentioned before, we cannot uh, have people from Australia with us because of the time difference. It's uh, early, very early in the morning there. But we got uh, messages that they will all watch it tomorrow. Uh, Yvonne Magarula is almost an icon in the anti-Uranium movement in, in Australia. And her hand became a symbol, a symbol to say no, no to Jabaluka, no to mining anywhere. Jabaluka is near Kakadu National Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And uh, the voice of Ivan Magarula is the voice of almost all Aboriginal people of Australia, because they say, these underworld, underworld powers should not be released because the forces are too much. It can never be handled by mankind. Yvonne started a campaign which led to an agreement between the Mirar, her people, and the mining company. So the land and its resources will not be touched without the approval of the Mirar people. Yeah, the end of the nuclear chain is still un an unsolved issue. There is a film called In Search of the Safest Place on Earth. And the film ends with, there is no place. Where to go? This is the big question. And since there was no answer for, for years, well, the, the question sometimes nobody asked, they saw the big sea and down it went. So the Atlantic and the Pacific are graves of atomic waste, of uh, nuclear submarines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, when they first split that atom, if you recall, there was this yes. attitude that, uh, well, you know, this will make waste, but we'll solve that problem later. And so it was always pushed down the road as a problem that we would just solve later, which of course we have never solved, uh, very and only done rather irresponsible things. And, and as you started to allude to, uh, one of the most irresponsible things that was decided to do with high level radioactive waste while we waited to solve this problem later was to put it in barrels and dump it into the ocean. And we have a graphic, which I hope you'll be able to see in a moment of just exactly what went on when we dumped radioactive waste into the ocean. And I'm, I'm understanding that we won't be able to show it to you, unfortunately. Um, but the uh, graphic shows that, unfortunately, I'm ashamed to say my home country of Great Britain was by far the worst offender uh, in dumping massive amounts of radioactive waste in barrels into the ocean. And actually, I think many people have probably seen uh, one of the Greenpeace's most famous videos of a rubber dinghy alongside one of those ships rolling those barrels of waste into the ocean. And one of the barrels actually hits the, um, the dinghy itself as they were trying to stop this. This practice was eventually stopped by the London Dumping Convention. Um, but as we know, we still 
haven't solved the radioactive waste problem. And since we are talking about radioactive waste now, I'm going to reintroduce Ian Zabate. If you're just joining us, Ian was on earlier talking about the effects on the Shoshone people of the years of atomic testing at the Nevada test site. But Ian, who is principal man of the Western bands of the Shoshone Nation of Indians, has also spent 30 years protecting his people's lands from a plan to dump all of the country's radioactive wastes inside Yucca Mountain, also in Nevada. Yucca Mountain at the moment is still theoretically canceled, but this illegal choice of Yucca Mountain is still the only place that has ever been named to house this country's high level nuclear reactor waste. So welcome back Ian to talk us through Yucca Mountain. Thank you. In 1982, the United States proposed to store high level nuclear waste from commercial nu nuclear reactors uh, in a deep geologic repository. The original intent of deep geologic repository was sub seabed, a mile underground. But in 1987, the United States Congress decided to make Yucca Mountain within Western Shoshone treaty defined territory as the only site to store 70,000 metric tons of high level nuclear waste. That is a uh, legislative malpractice by the United States Congress. It is a treaty violation. Uh, treaties emanate from international law, and that is why they are the supreme law of the land under the United States Constitution, Article 6, Section 2. So Congress, in proposing to store its nuclear waste problem in Shoshone country, is legislative malpractice and a treaty violation. Ever since the United States came into Shoshone country in secret, in 1951 to develop nuclear weapons testing and began developing those uh, weapons of mass destruction, killing our people, killing the land. Uh, it has been that culture of secrecy that has hidden what has been going on. The proposal to develop a high level nuclear waste repository at Yucca Mountain also came under the culture of secrecy, though it claims to be an open process and transparent. The, Department of Energy created a systematic process to dismantle the living lifeways of the Shoshone people called cultural triage. We believe that cultural triage meets the minimum threshold of genocide under the UN Convention on Punishment and Prevention of the Crime of Genocide. Genocide became a crime in the United States in 1988 when the United States a Congress, uh, uh, when the United States uh, passed the Proxmire Act, which is the UNS, UN, U.S. enactments of the U.N. Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. That was uh, uh, the problem of cultural triage was created in 1990 after genocide became a crime in the United States. We believe that uh, the creation of the repository and the systematic process uh, against the Shoshone people is intent to commit the crime of genocide. And we are trying to enforce laws, enforce the treaty, enforce the US Human Rights Enforcement Act of 2009 against those perpetrators of crimes. Perpetrators of crimes should not benefit from their crimes. The Shoshone people are here. We're not dead, we're not dying, and we're not going anywhere. And we do not consent to the use of our land for high level nuclear waste. It is a crime against humanity, and we are going to defend it, and we are going to fight, and we're going to win, and we thank all of you for your help in this uh, uh, atlas for uh, bringing attention to these issues. As I said earlier, what we need is additional funding for research. Uh, origin is important, and we've always been here, and we are living here in the Great Basin with the oldest life in the, on the planet. That is what we're trying to protect. We're trying to protect our land and our people. We have 11,000 year, 11, year old uh, creosote, which is a clone plant. We have 6,800 year old bristlecone pine. We have the Pando, which is up to 25 square miles 
and 80,000 year old. And then we have the water, pure pristine water, which has been flowing for uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. And that is what is important to our people, the water, that is our identity. Our primary use of the land is our identity. Our primary use of the water is our identity. And we believe that is our faith in the water, in the land. The creator gave us instructions of how to live in balance and harmony with the land. And that is our title here. And it comes through uh, uh, our relationship with the United States by the treaty and not the Bible. So those are the important points, land, water, and our identity. Thank you, Ian. I think we're gonna to go to Klaus now to introduce the last segment of our program today. Before we get to questions, I'll just remind you that we are live on YouTube and Facebook. If you have questions, we are collecting them there. They will be sent across to us soon. And as we wrap up the program, we will then ask some of your questions as time permits um, before we close the program today. So over to you, Klaus. I think you're still on mute. Oh, there we go. You're still on mute. Shall I just go ahead? Yeah, and no, uh, okay. yeah. Well, is the Yvonne Margarula piece ready to be shown? Let's try, says uh, Franz. So let's try. It's Mirar land. The markings are sacred, ageless. Kakadu National Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site where the Jabiluka uranium mine is proposed. Eight billion uranium dollars lying beneath the red earth. Yvonne Margarula is the Mirar senior traditional owner. She says, no way. The Mirar know what they are facing. The ranger uranium mine has already poisoned their sacred land. Yvonne Margarula The search is for turtles across the cracked earth. The Mirar people live totally connected to the natural world. Their land is sacred. To lose one's land is to lose one's spirit. The Mirar people are on a journey to halt the rape of their spirit and their land. Yvonne Margarula hopes that UNESCO will place Kakadu on the in danger list of World Heritage Sites. 
But the struggle of the Mirah is not only a fight to turn northern Australia into a nuclear-free zone. Only as keepers of their own land are the Mirah keepers of their own future. Inscribed on stone, their ancestors remind them of their guardian role. When we say no, kayaki, they're not mining that country. We say no, kayaki. Here, countless generations of hands have met as one hand. And today, Yvonne Margarula's hand sends out but one message. Stop Jabiluka. Then Jabiluka was stopped. It was, and that hand has sort of become a universal symbol. Many of us use that hand in an image on the Aboriginal flag today as the symbol to keep it in the ground, which is, of course, the main title of the program today, Klaus. Yes, and uh, it's time that we go beyond nuclear. Linda, I would like to pick your brain a bit because your organization has been uh, working on a future beyond nuclear for a long time and now we have to listen to this myth that the climate crisis is so severe and we cannot just uh, say uranium should stay in the ground nuclear is the way to go what do we answer those people who uh, the mainstream media give them all, always time to speak so it's really important that we come up with good arguments. Indeed. And, you know, why are we even still talking about nuclear power? I ask myself that question every day. It is dirty, as we've described from the beginning of the uranium chain to the end. It is dangerous. Uh, we've seen the devastating accidents and also the fact that it's then transitions to nuclear weapons. And it's crazy expensive. Just look at the latest news about the Flamanville 3 nuclear power plant under construction for years now in France, which has ballooned to an extraordinary 25.1, 21, I should say, 21.5 billion dollar price tag. It started out predicted to cost 3.3 billion dollars. So what kind of industry could possibly survive that. Uh, we'll take a look, hopefully, in the Atlas in a moment if we can see those graphics. But in the meantime, before we do that, I actually, I, I'm going to get to those graphics shortly, Franza. But um, before that, I want to just briefly talk about another aspect of environmental racism, which we've touched on a little bit earlier. We've talked a lot about the impact on Indigenous people. And in this country uh, of, of the United States, there's another demographic uh, in the spirit of Black Lives Matter, which we've been talking about a lot lately, uh, the demographic of the African-American population, which has been particularly uh, disenfranchised and targeted with new nuclear power plants. Two quick examples, one in Mississippi, where there is an existing nuclear power plant at Grand Gulf, and a second one was proposed but eventually cancelled. But there, there was a, a blatantly racist law passed by the majority white Mississippi state legislature to redirect 70% of the tax dollars from that first nuclear power plant out of the community where it sits. This is the poorest community in the poorest state in the country, 87% black, and they redirected 70% of the tax dollars to richer, whiter counties around the state to keep the electricity prices down. And then the other example would be Georgia at the plant Vogel site where there are two operating nuclear power plants and two more under construction like Flamanville way behind schedule vastly over budget and a poor black community there 
which strongly objected to the new reactors, they're already suffering the health impacts of the first two and living not very far away from the huge nuclear weapons complex, the Savannah River site, just across the river and state line in South Carolina. The bitterest pill for that black community was that Vogel three and four only went forward for two reasons. One was that ratepayers were charged in advance for the electricity that Vogel three and four may never in fact generate. And the other was a huge government subsidy. And the person who came down there and announced that subsidy in person, flanked on either side by a white nuclear power plant worker was I'm afraid to say the past president, Barack Obama. So that's testimony to the kind of environmental racism that the African-American community till still are confronted with today. Now we'll take a look at the atlas and I think we are gonna be able to see uh, um, the graph on page 46 because we want to look at, well, why isn't it game over for nuclear power? That's what we called our chapter, game over for nuclear power. It should be, why isn't it? And this graph here uh, shows you the share prices for the four largest nuclear companies in the world. And everybody, including China, is on a downward tra trajectory. So it's not looking very good for nuclear investment. Um, China, of course, is heavily into renewables as well. They're doing sort of all of the above. In the next graph on that same page, we see the rather insignificant role, a sliver actually in that pie chart that nuclear power is playing right now in the world energy market. It's pretty small, um, but as you can see, we've got a long way to go to get rid of fossil fuels. Um, and, but that graph also shows you that the answer to getting rid of fossil fuels is certainly not nuclear power. On the next page, uh, there are two graphs side by side, and on the left-hand one, um, as you can see, uh, the nuclear power is the only, only source of electricity generation when we're talking about new build where the price is going up. So price for new nuclear power plants more, price for new solar plants going, going down. So again, nuclear is not the answer. And on the adjacent graph, we see the costs. Um, and that renewables are outpacing nuclear and all other forms of electricity. And so these graphs, of course, don't actually answer the question I asked at the beginning, which is why isn't it game over for nuclear power? And I think there are a couple of reasons why not. And one of them is that the nuclear power industry and its lobbyists have used this argument about climate change quite convincingly. It's completely erroneous as we've seen, but they are convincing the governments that um, they need to be here. We need to continue to use nuclear power and we need to build new reactors in order to address climate change. And this gives them the opportunity to get funding for those new reactors. Uh, the lead candidate right now is something called the small modular reactor, or we call it the small modular nuclear reactor which in fact um, would not be any cheaper even than the large nuclear reactors. The cost per kilowatt hour of electricity generated by small modular nuclear reactors would actually be more because of their poor economies of scale. And that brings us to the last graphic that we are going to show you today. And that is really uh, appropriately, it's all green. And this is a map that shows you renewable energy and how uh, cost effective it is compared to other forms of energy. Uh, you can see that renewable energy can produce a kilowatt hour of electricity for just a few US cents. Estimates for new nuclear power plants, depending on the circumstances, could see the price soar as high as 35 cents per kilowatt hour. So in conclusion, nuclear power is propped up financially in two ways. Uh, in some countries like France and Russia and China because it is state owned and in countries like the United States and in the United Kingdom because ratepayers are gouged in advance for a reactor that they may never see and also because it is subsidized heavily by governments. And of course, for some countries, the appeal of new nuclear power plants, countries like Saudi Arabia, who have never had nuclear power, 
is that it is the pathway to nuclear weapons. Let's, we have to never forget that. We've made that very clear throughout the Atlas that these two things, nuclear power and nuclear weapons, are connected from the very first moment that that first gram of ore was mined out of the ground. And it is a relationship that will persist until we get rid of both nuclear power and nuclear weapons. So that brings us, I believe, to the conclusion of our presentation. Uh, we want to, Klaus and I would love to thank again our wonderful guests. We couldn't have done it without you. So thank you so much, all of you, for being with us today. And we'll turn it over now, I believe, to questions. And um, Horst Harm, our co-editor, or actually the editor-in-chief, who did a heroic job putting this atlas together, is going to send us some of those questions. I don't know, Klaus, if you've had a chance to look yet in the chat to see what's no. there, but um, I'll let you pick up the first question. I cannot read any question. Well, I believe we've had a question on ocean dumping. Let's see. I'm not sure that it's there. Yeah. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like we have any direct questions coming through from the chat yet, but um, I think we should probably ask each of our panelists if they'd like to offer any final thoughts, uh, maybe beginning with you, Anna, if there's something that you didn't have time to say when we started out and would like to add now, this would be a great moment to give us um, some final thoughts on your particular fight. We could also deplete it Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, thank you for this um, opportunity again. Um, I think with the elections going on with uh, Biden and um, the other party, uh, Biden was uh, in his energy policy that he wants to promote mentions the use of nuclear energy because he believes it's cleaner. So in March, that's when I remember he made that statement. And so we were, ha we were having a, a Navajo Nation Council public hearings with Navajo uh, uranium communities in March. And, and so Peterson Zaw was there and I remember that I mentioned that Biden supports uranium mining. So I think in, in who we vote for, the politics, and even for people that serve on their committees, they should um, make sure that the indigenous voices and voices of people that have been impacted by the nuclear weapons and the bombs and energy uh, should have a voice at his policy table in terms of energy development, along with um, AOC, who I heard that's gonna be, if he's elected, will be heading up the uh, climate um, justice uh, office. So those are some things that we're very concerned about. Um, so anyway, we're, we're, I hope Beyond Nuclear can also have their ear to the ground in DC and, and help us monitor that, those discussions and somehow infiltrate you know, that party somehow. But very thank you. Good. Yes, thank you, Anna. And, and, and indeed, yes, and we've been watching very closely the developments with the Green New Deal in particular, where nuclear power does seem to sort of creep in and out of there. Um, so we are eager to make the point, of course, that Klaus made earlier, which is that if you if in the Green New Deal you decide to support nuclear power, then you may as well throw out your environmental justice component because you've just violated it completely. It makes no sense for a green policy that purports to be focused on environmental justice that does then support nuclear power given every phase of the chain that hurts indigenous people. We do have a question actually for Ian in the Q&A here. And um, Ian, I think you might have to turn your camera and uh, audio back on yourself. But the question is, do you think the Supreme Court ruling regarding Oklahoma will help kill the Yucca waste dump? 
And then there's a second question, uh, where exactly was the nuclear waste dumped, which is nowhere yet still at the nuclear sites. But this person would like to know whether the, uh, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruling will help kill the Yucca waste dump. Ian. Sure, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can, are you able to turn your camera on as well? We'd love to no, see. No, you guys have to turn my camera on, but I'll talk uh, until that happens. Uh, there are 115 commercial nuclear reactors across the United States and uh, in se at 75 locations, some have multiple reactors in 30 states. And each of those reactors uh, would ship their nuclear waste to a proposed high level nuclear waste repository at Yucca Mountain in Shoshone country. Uh, those individual waste streams would become a river. And while communities that have the waste at the reactor sites would bear the burden of risk from only their reactors uh, waste, we would be expected to bear the burden of every reactor as they enter Shoshone country. And that is environmental racism. They get all the benefits, the jobs, the taxes, the technology, and we are expected to bear the uh, adverse health consequences and risk from every shipment if there's an accident. And it really is a big problem in transportation, whether it be to uh, Shoshone country or to New Mexico, to the proposed consolidated interim storage facility because transportation uh, is weak. There is no way to pick up a reactor uh, either a reactor vessel or nuclear waste if it falls off of the tracks uh, in an isolated part of the continent. There's no way, there's no quality assurance. There's no way to pick it up, to uh, fix it, to clean it up. Uh, at the Yucca Mountain site, the Department of Energy cannot prove ownership, as I mentioned earlier, because the treaty is in full force and effect. The Department of Energy is required to prove ownership under uh, 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 63 CFR 960.121, and it cannot be met. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has admitted this in their uh, uh, safety evaluation report, volume four. Now the New Mexico case uh, deals with Congress not explicitly extinguishing the reservation of Oklahoma which was all Indian country. In the Shoshone case, uh, that Oklahoma case only reinforces the fact that with regard to the Shoshone Treaty, there has been no uh, title extinguishment. Shoshone title is, remains unextinguished and the treaty uh, is controlling under the United States Constitution because the intent of the treaty is to maintain the existence of both signatory parties, the United States and the Western bands of the Shoshone Nation of Indians. So the Oklahoma case does reinforce the Shoshone uh, uh, rights, titles and interests to Yucca Mountain. And our primary purpose here is to protect and defend our land, which is our identity. So it is actually our survival, which is at issue here. And we're not good at dying. So we're going to fight on this issue uh, to preserve our uh, land, to preserve our people. And that is our identity. Our dignity requires at least that we do this. So we uh, hope you'll all join with us and fight against these uh, racist policies. Thank you, Ian. There was a question, we've got the question now about the ocean dumping, and it was um, about where actually the ocean dumping took place. And um, I'm just gonna make sure I can see what I'm doing here, because I'm gonna put the graphic up again, since we couldn't see it earlier. Oh, we can see it now. Great, thank you. So as you can see, uh, when it came to the United Kingdom, most of it was in the Atlantic, the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, the former Soviet Union up in the Arctic Sea, and then the, uh, to a lesser degree, although not negligible, 
uh, we see some in the further south in the Atlantic and also in the Pacific Ocean. So that answers the question on the radioactive waste. Uh, we'll go back to the questions now if we can lose the graphic and I'm able to see the Q&A. Uh, so Klaus, are you able to see the questions coming in? And Well, there was one question to Sasha. How many more states are needed so the, the treaty would be ratified? And also they ask you, Sasha, why doesn't Germany sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? I think that they are maybe confusing that with the uh, treaty ban, uh, the ban treaty, but go ahead. Yeah. So with regard to the ratification, um, we have um, at the moment 38, uh, 39, I think, ratifications. So it's um, 11 ratifications missing until we have the amount of 50 ratifications, which would make the treaty enter into force. And with regard to the question why Germany is not participating in the um, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, um, uh, I have to say that in my presentation, I only distinguish between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. But in fact, there's something in between. We could call them the nuclear hybrid states. Um, and Germany is one among them. So within the so-called nuclear sharing framework of NATO, so the, uh, the, the alliance between um, mainly uh, the US and uh, many uh, European states, here we can see the, the graph just with the worldwide arsenals, um, where you can see that most of the arsenals, 93%, uh, belong to uh, Russia and uh, the United States. But these are um, uh, some of the, the US weapons you have just seen are stationed in Europe, actually, within um, the, uh, the framework of the nuclear sharing of NATO, about 100 to 150 um, uh, weapons of the United States. Uh, 20 of them are stationed in Germany. They are on German military bases, and they would also be delivered by German carrier systems and German pilots. So the idea of this nuclear sharing system is actually that through the carrier systems, the German government or the governments of the other um, uh, states, uh, yeah, here, here we have the, the graphic for uh, nuclear sharing, thank you. So that all those states share control over the use um, uh, of these weapons. And this is the very reason why they don't participate in this uh, treaty, because the treaty prohibits not only to possess them, those states don't possess them, we could say they borrow them in a certain way or a certain kind, but the treaty also prohibits to allow other nations, other states, station nuclear weapons on their soil. And having nuclear weapons on their, US nuclear weapons on their soil, um, um, of course, is a problem uh, for them uh, with regard to um, adhering or participating in the in the treaty, which would not allow that. So that would be the the answer why Germany does not um, participate. Thank you, Sasha. I have a question actually from Makoma uh, before we get to the, the last question that I see in the chat, uh, and that Makoma is uh, having to sort of confront yet again the possibility that South Africa might explore nuclear power. You, you defeated it once already. Um, and are you back in the same fight again? Is it also against Rosatom? Are other countries now trying to come in there and uh, invite contracts with nuclear power plants? Where, where are you at in that fight to keep nuclear power out of South Africa? Um... I think firstly is that um, we've seen this um, taking place several times by different ministers that are coming to force. Unfortunately, our ministers have got a short time span. Sometimes they don't even complete the period that they, are, they, 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 they have been elected on. So um, we, saw, we saw a renewal of um, a call to um, resuscitate the nuclear ambition of the country. But we know that um, this is in violation of the court ruling in 2017, which had set aside all intergovernmental agreements that the, the, the country had signed with different countries, which the latest was uh, Rosatom. 
and uh, we see another call by the new minister. But in our minds, we know that um, ministers are elected officials, and tomorrow that minister can go uh, can, can be replaced. So the issue is with the bureaucrats within um, the energy departments that are so adamant um, to increase or to expand the South African um, nuclear fleet. Now they talk about the small modular reactors. And um, around 2010, we had a pebble bed modular reactors, um, which was abandoned by the government with almost 13 billion rents going down the drain. And uh, this resuscitation of small modular reactors, we don't know what's so different about them as we had failed with the pebble bed modular reactor. So that is not actually going to bring any energy security in the country. We are going to see another risk of South African um, a much needed uh, money. We also are going to risk the lives of our people. Right now, as we speak, uh, Kuwait, the only nuclear power station in Africa, is a ticking bomb. There's so much waste around it uh, that um, space will be running out in no time. So we don't know what this is all about when Africa and South Africa has got unexploited um, solar, unexploited wind that can generate electricity. This is clean. And um, the other story that we hear is that of nuclear is clean. It's not. Nuclear fuel chain is the most carbon intensive process ever. And um, I think for us, uh, what is important is to ensure that uh, this energy decentralized energy system that is going to benefit particularly poor people in the country. But however, we are holding um, the politicians and the companies, we are holding them accountable and um, we want them to also uh, think about the redress that is needed um, of the people that are already suffering in Namakwaland where the waste of Quebec is being stored, the people who are suffering around um, the townships in Johannesburg because there's no proper management of um, this radioactive um, waste, this radioactivity in the area. So that cannot go on. So for us, we'd go on and fight against nuclear and we'd call nuclear energy and we'd call on all active citizens in the country to be able to be part of that, but also what is more frightening is that the way this nuclear is being uh, introduced, um, it's in a kind that South Africans are being blackmailed and they're being held ransom. Now we don't have um, electricity. There's a lot of load shedding. People don't have electricity in the country at particular times. So it's a way of like blackmailing South Africans to say we need this nuclear. Every time there's this major announcement, we need that. But then this is at a backdrop of the two um, biggest coal, two of the biggest coal-fired power stations in the country that um, had um, cost overruns and also have been delayed in construction. And so for us, nuclear, it's much more not an option for, for South Africa, even for the whole of Africa. Because we see that the process of starting South Africa and then the whole Africa, uh, some of the countries in Africa are being bullied into signing also intergovernmental agreements and being told that nuclear is clean. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a solution to climate change, which is not. And um, this it is, it's, it's, it's at expense of ordinary people, particularly black people who live around these mining areas. So there is no environmental justice in the country, even though we have the kind of legislation, environmental legislation that is aimed at protecting uh, the environment. People are not involved. People are not um, um, consulted as to when this 
processes are taking place. So in such, it's environmental injustice and at the end it's going to lead to environmental degradation in the country and also in, in, in the whole of, of, of the continent. So the continent activists are coming together and we're sharing lessons and uh, we also are focusing on um, making sure that our governments invest more in renewable energy uh, technologies rather than in the deadly nuclear energy. Thank you, Makoma. Thank, thank you very much, Makoma. Well, I think we probably have time for one last question, Klaus. Don't you think you want to pick one from the list and then you've got a, we've got another special treat, hopefully, which we'll play at the end of this. Yes. Well, I have no other question available here. Okay, well, I think there was just one, um, there were a couple that touched on human rights in general. Oh, okay. yes. What is the most important thing we can do to join with our indigenous nations to right these wrongs to the highest degree possible? And then there's another question that says, how could human rights legislation protect the environment and the people? The most important idea for me is that nuclear power is the new form of colonialism. So those are a little bit connected and um, I'm not sure if one of our panelists would like to tackle either of those. Um, this is Anna, may I, uh, may I address real quick? Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Okay, so in, in terms of uh, the human rights initiatives, um, I, I believe um, right now, you know, it's not, it's not far-fetched in using um, human rights because right now there's a state, there's a congressional representatives um, in Detroit, uh, representative Taleb, who introduced legislation, um, water is a human right. So that's to prevent um, shut off of water and other provisions in um, uh, having access to, to water. So there's that, that's a very um, good precedent to have in terms of having legislation, um, at least in, in the United States Congress. Um, the other thing for indigenous um, support allyship is you can educate yourself on the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples. Go to their website. Um, you can um, sign up for their uh, updates on what's going on in terms of racism because there are new uh, committees created since um, March addressing uh, indigenous peoples rights. Um, the other thing too, um, you can also get local or state or even a country to denounce the doctrine of discovery, which is the root of the evil that has and that has and continues to destroy. Um, it's a it's a spiritual war, um, and so that doctrine of discovery says that we are not human. And I'm sorry to say, but it's even honored in the Supreme Court with the Oneida Nation, Ginsburg. Um, evoke the doctrine of discovery and deny the Oneida Nation getting their land back. So those are two things that you can do. You can even have your local municipality or groups um, also endorse the United Nations um, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you. This Thank is you, Ian uh, Zabarti as well. I can add to the uh, discussion about human rights and what the way we were able to win at Yucca Mountain was make the United States prove ownership. A very simple, any legislation on this continent make the government prove ownership. You want a, a military base expansion, prove ownership. You want a nuclear waste dump, prove ownership. In any case, they must prove ownership and they can't do it in Shoshone country because the treaty's in full force and effect. So we think that that's uh, important. Every step in the nuclear chain releases CO2. People need to understand that. Radiation is everywhere, technologically enhanced, whether it's coal, coal contains uranium. Fracking, fracking releases uranium. So people need to become aware of these things and realize that some people bear a greater burden of risk than others, and that is environmental racism. So proving ownership is important. Thank you, Ian. Well, now it's time, I think, for a big thank you uh, for all our guests who joined us today. Sasha Hach, Makoma Lekalakala, Ian Zabate, Anna Rondon, 
and also, thank you, Anne, and also to Tina Cordova and to Larry King, who joined us by video, as did Yvonne Margarula from Australia in a video from some time past. So thank you so much to all our guests today. And last words to you, Klaus, to introduce uh, what we hope will be a beautiful wrap up to this wonderful event. Klaus? Yes, well, I would uh, like to say that the Atlas from now on will be available and it's a, a piece of creative commons. So everybody can put the Atlas on uh, their website, their organization's website, and you can download it from nuclearfree.com, Uranium Atlas, Rosa Lux.de, uh, beyondnuclear.org, IPP and W, Switzerland, IPP and W, Germany, and Don't Nuke the Climate, org in Australia. So I guess it's not too difficult to find the Atlas if you want it. Yeah, that was it. It was really great to have you all. And I think empowered we go home. But before you, before we go, I would like to in, invite you to stay another two minutes. Because uh, I'm always excited when I see this animation film. It is called Dark Room and gets the issues to the point. The film is drawn and directed by German film artist Anna Luisa Schmidt. And we say thank you to Anna and thank you to all of you and watch the film. <laughs>